Hi, this is Eric Hess with The Encrypted Economy. So before getting into this week's episode, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the U.S. Capitol this past week. Chairman Gensler of the SEC sort of laid out his plan in this Aspen speech about how he wants to regulate or enforce against crypto and get more resources and all that good stuff. The infrastructure bill was put before the Senate and had all these crypto IRS reporting provisions in it that were kind of extensive, probably weren't the best thought out. It was really a bad decision. <laughs> And it almost overturned the entire infrastructure bill. And even then, it wasn't revised the way that it should have been. It's broken. It doesn't work. It's unfortunate. Um, sometimes it's the way politics work. But anyway, we're going to be talking more about that in the coming weeks. There's a lot of news about it. This is not a news channel, but we will do more in-depth coverage and uh, provide some insight into what to expect going forward. But again, just because we cover it doesn't mean we're a crypto podcast. We are an encrypted economy covering encryption. <laughs> as well as digital asset, digital assets, digital data. Anyway, so today we have the pleasure of talking to Nelson Rosario on the podcast, partner with Smolensky Rosario Law. He's got an expertise in the cross-section between digital assets and intellectual property. Started with some questions. What is non-fungibility in an NFT? Do NFT purchasers even know what they're buying? How difficult is it to enforce copyright laws across jurisdictions when it comes to NFTs? Because of course they're jurisdiction-less. And then we talk about where do NFTs live, meaning where are they custodied, where are they stored, what happens when they don't live there anymore, what happens if there's a change in custodians, if the chain is immutable but the media doesn't persist, it doesn't matter. We talk about cross-platform royalties, the subjectivity of art and NFTs for value, and we talk about the promise of NFTs for authenticating property rights in the physical world. Now, a few weeks ago, we did uh, an episode with Somos and Genobank where we talked about uh, associating genomic research with an NFT. But that was a fascinating episode. I encourage you to listen to it. This is not that episode. <laughs> this is, we're talking about NFTs as it relates to art, as it relates to music, physical world assets. It covers a lot of topics. It's great to talk to Nelson about this. He certainly has a command of the issues across all these points. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as, as I did. And if you like the show, put some comments in it, share the word, spread the good word. The show is getting picked up more. And that's encouraging. I like to see that. Definitely listening ship is going up. So please continue to, to spread it out and, and share it with others if you like the podcast. Now, before I go, transcripts. If you want transcripts, go to theencryptedeconomy.com. This is not a promo because I don't make any money from it. I'm just, the whole reason why I keep that website open is I'm already covered on YouTube. I'm already covered in podcast channels. But if you want transcripts, that's where they are. If you don't want it, I, I can take it down, but I'd rather give it to you if you want it. So if you want transcripts, Go to EncryptEconomy.com. You'll find them there associated with every episode. So with all that said, let's start the show with Nelson Rosario. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a weekly podcast featuring discussions exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel. I have spent decades representing regulated exchanges, broker-dealers, investment advisors, and all matter of fintech companies for all things touching electronic trading with a focus on new and developing technologies. So this is Eric Hess with The Encrypted Economy. And today we're really excited to have Nelson Rosario from the law firm of Smolinsky Rosario Law on the show where he's a principal. He is also an adjunct law professor at Illinois Tech. Nelson, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Eric. I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Excellent. So we'll start out like we always do. Maybe tell us a little bit about your background and then before we get into the uh, into the show. Sure. So, yeah, I'm a co-founder of Solinsky Rosario Law. We're based here in Chicago, Illinois. We're mostly an intellectual property firm that also does general counseling services for small to mid-sized tech companies. Decent amount of our business is uh, crypto clients that are doing a variety of things with the technology. So, as you mentioned, I'm also an adjunct law professor at Illinois Tech, where uh, I teach a class called Blockchain, Cryptocurrency, and the Law that actually started January of 2018. We announced it right before Bitcoin hit 10,000 the first time in November in 2017. So, that class has had a lot of interest. But uh, that's kind of the, I guess, the boring, uh, typical lawyer answer to a little bit about myself. Um, I took a slightly different path to uh, becoming an attorney. So like most lawyers, I got a degree in history and political science, but then I started working while my wife was in grad school and 
it was while I was working in elections, actually. I worked in election administration, so I was a, a lowly county government employee that I first got interested in tech and the law and kind of how they all interplayed. So I started looking for legal jobs, you know, that would be able to kind of scratch that itch. That's when I found intellectual property. And so I realized, oh, I would really do well to have a tech background. And so I went back to school while I was working like an idiot um, and got a second degree in computer science. And the rest kind of more or less has, has fallen into place along the way. Excellent. Excellent. So today we're going to be diving a little bit into NFTs. Uh, we talked about NFTs with some other guests. So we had Donna Riddell on the show. We touched on it there. We had Mark Boyron on the show where we talked about NFTs and what makes them securities. So today we're going to be diving a little bit more into NFTs, the property, like what do you get, the license, the ownership, and, and all that all that interesting stuff. So, But before we even dive into that, let's talk a little bit about the fungibility of NFTs because you know it's easy to pass over. It's like oh you know you know fungible is it's not one to one. Non fungible is it's one to one. I get something very unique. I can't trade it for anything else. And it's like okay, I, people get it and they move on. But in fact, it actually has relevance because NFTs is sort of a broad category. And as you start to tease out the different elements of it, what actually is fungible and non fungible for any particular use case has relevance. So I'll just take a real world example. I like Gordon Haas. He's a Bucks County painter. I, I've met him a few times. I own a painting by him. I also own a number of lithographs because I can't keep buying paintings by him, I'll be broke. So <laughs> I have a low double digit series numbers on the lithograph out of 250. That one's pretty easy. My lithograph, 34 out of 250, that's non-fungible. Nobody would even question that. Now, but let's change the fact pattern. Let's say Gordon, uploads this, my 34 out of 250 to the internet. And now he launches millions of it, but they're all numbered. So 5 million, and you can get number 34 out of, what did I say, 5 million, 5 million. Mm -hmm. Is that still non-fungible? I think that's a, a great fact pattern. And I think this concept of fungibility is something that is intuitive to basically everyone. But I think it's a concept that you don't really start digging down deep into until you fall down the rabbit hole of crypto like so many of us have. Because as you said, there are certain implications raised by fungibility. I mean, at its core, this idea of a guarantee of a certain level of fungibility is kind of what drove Bitcoin to be created in the first place, right? You know, this idea that you would actually know for certain that I didn't send, you know, five Bitcoin to my partner that I'm claiming I sent to you. And so now we're seeing these issues come up again with respect to NFTs. And I think it depends on, you know, where someone sits. You know, if someone, I think it's a perfectly reasonable position for somebody to say, if there are more than one of something, it's fungible. And, you know, a non-fungible token, should, there should only be one of it. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate to the traditional art world, like you were saying. You know, there are there is value in limited series of paintings and other works of art. And but where do you draw the line? Just the sheer magnitude of five million uh, digital representations of this does have that. <laughs> right. <laughs> that so if we're trying to if we're trying to get to the magic number, which of course there is no magic number. Right. You know, if Gordon says, you know, I did two hundred fifty of these before, I'm going to make them digital. And Eric is still going to get number 34. He does an airdrop. He does an artist airdrop. If you own the original lithograph, you get an That's a great idea. Somebody should pay me for that if it makes money, of course. <laughs> right? But I get an airdrop of his digital represent of his NFT digital representation. Number 34 might be worth more than 249. Uh, number one probably might be worth the most. So arguably within that number series, the order might actually mean something, but to your point, once you get to 5 million, you're not going to be seeing any kind of meaningful distinction. If I own, you know, 4 million and one and you own 4 million and two, nobody's going to be like, yeah, I'll trade, I'll, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. buy, I'll swap my 4 million and two for your 4 million and one plus $10,000 because I really want the one, you know, unless there's like a magic to the number. Like sometimes like some numbers have significance, like a birthday of an artist. But I think this brings up a broader point with respect to NFTs, just kind of as jet in general, as we've seen them out in the wild, in that, you know, this is really related to art. And art is just fundamentally subjective. And so it just so happens, you know, there's a lot of financial value 
that is tied to this. And it's kind of been born out of a system that really was financially driven initially and is now expanding into other areas. But you're never going to really get away from that subjectivity with respect to pieces of art, I don't think. So if you have a ravenous fan base that thinks all 5 million NFTs are worth whatever, then that's what they're going to be worth. You know, I mean, it's almost kind of a more difficult question than, you know, the the question that always comes up with respect to cryptocurrency. What is money? You know, well, money is whatever people say it is. This kind of gets to, well, what is art and why does it have value? And, you know, you're never going to get an answer for that. Right. Well put. But, you know, I, I think it, it sort of touches on, you know, this notion that NFTs certainly can be distributed to a point where they become fungible because they no longer have unique value in and of themselves. They're easily transferred for one another for the exact same value with, with actually no difference. Okay, so then and let's sort of start to touch into property rights with NFT. So just to sort of break it down and I'll, I'll throw out mine, but I'll, I'll look to you to refine it. You know, on the one hand, you have an NFT that represents or it's connected to an image. And there is a value associated with that image or what that image represents. On the other end, it's it, it's more akin to authenticated evidence of some other right whose value does not necessarily lie in the image itself. Like, for example, a notary seal on a deed. And then probably where the universe lies in terms of use cases and, and value is the continuum between those two points. Or is it broader than that? Like, your, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the particular terms and kind of understanding around any of these transactions. You know, I, from what I've observed, it seems like NFT purchasers, a lot of them believe that they're getting a lot more rights than they are necessarily in the NFTs themselves. But not just the purchasers. I do think that, you know, when it comes to individual artists, they're often trying to give as many rights associated with the underlying artwork. Uh, in the sale of the NFT. Um, I think there's an open question as to, okay, how do you do that in a way that a court of law will actually recognize it, right? Because like when the rubber actually meets the road, that's what's going to matter. You know, the and that's why there's a bit of a misalignment in the market in terms of what people think they're selling, what people think they're buying, and also what the platforms think their responsibilities or rights in any of this may be by facilitating all of these transactions. I think in a sense the most kind of straightforward approach we've seen so far are from the NFT sales with that have been done by big brands because big brands have a very different uh, risk profile and set of considerations than individual artists or uh, you know individual purchasers, and they more or less have kind of taken a line. Okay, we're selling you this NFT. It's one of five related to this piece of artwork as part of a promotional program, and you have rights to display the NFT. You have rights to possess it, and that's basically it. <laughs> you know, we're not giving up any sort of underlying intellectual property rights. Now, you know, in this universe or any other discovered universe in the future, uh, and you're just getting this NFT. You know, that's kind of like the easy answer. The more interesting question becomes, okay, well, what if I'm a digital artist and I want to transfer all of my copyright in the underlying image? And I want it to be recognized in as many jurisdictions as possible because I want the purchaser to have you know, a high degree of confidence that they'll be the recognized owner of the art and the NFT. Well, that gets a lot trickier. <laughs> you know, to a certain extent, intellectual property, you know, copyright in particular has been kind of normalized across jurisdictions, but not completely. It's not like there's one set of copyright rules that you have to follow to be able to assert that you're the lawful copyright holder in the artwork itself. And in a certain sense, it's not that different from the traditional art world, right? And the example that you gave before, you know, you have a right to display that painter's work in your house, but if you hung it up in a local gallery and he found out about it, you know, he's going to have a cause of action and probably be quite upset. Yeah. Especially if I marketed it as an original. Right. But if I marketed it as a lithograph, I could resell it. The art world is interesting because, for example, when I bought this lithograph, I didn't sign a contract. I paid him cash. Mm -hmm. which or maybe that's an AML issue. I don't know, but uh, I'm <laughs> kidding. It wasn't that much cash. Don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I paid him cash and I got the painting. And so possession is what nine tenths of the law. So, or in this case, all of it, I own it. 
I mean, mm -hmm. if I if I try to market it as my own, okay, I think there's definitely a copyright issue there. But you tell me. I mean, you know, if I chose to display it in a gallery not as my own, I'm probably okay. Yeah, you're probably okay. It's it's when you are then trying to kind of profit as if it was your own work of art. And this has kind of been a, a problem actually plaguing the NFT platform so far is that, you know, famous artists are putting out a, an NFT series and then, you know, people are copying the images and then they're selling it on a different platform as if it was their own artwork. And it's difficult for these artists to try and combat that problem. You know, they're reaching out to the platforms and by and large, it appears the platforms are doing the best that they can. But the ease of going through that <laughs> nefarious scenario versus you, you know, pretending that you are the other artist or that you created the artwork, the physical artwork is it's quite different. The scale is just, you know, not the same. Right. And then it gets to the question of like, if the purchaser isn't controlling the link, isn't controlling the server, then the server is in control of whoever it is, we could be the artist. And I think there was even one sort of comical case of an artist. And I don't know all the details, you might be more familiar with it, but he basically, he had a painting or something and it was purchased on, I guess, open seas or rareable or what have you. And then after the purchase, he substituted the image with an oriental rug, you know, sort of capturing this notion of a rug, rug pull. But it was, it was, you know, I, I don't know whether it went back. It was really, it was all, it, apparently it was done to really highlight the fact that the link that you have, you can't take that image with you necessarily. You know, presumably there's a contract for that, but what do you get when you've just done a transaction online and, and how would you even enforce that? You know, the storage issue is a very big issue because do the platforms want to take on all the liability of, of hosting and whatever server configuration they have, all of the digital artwork that is associated with the NFTs and then maintaining it and making sure that, you know, it's secure and that nobody can hack in and change all of the images or just delete them all. So, all you know, everyone's getting broken links when they're trying to display their NFTs. You know, is there some sort of other storage solution that would be amenable? Do individual artists want to actually host it and, you know, deal with all of the kind of technical problems that that arise that, you know, that can bring up? And same thing with, you know, companies, et cetera. Uh, in a certain sense, you know, an NFT sale at first blush seems fairly straightforward. But when you start asking kind of pointed questions, okay, well, where is where is the underlying art going to live? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> okay, well, is it going to be on the platform server? You know, all these different storage options. Okay. And what exactly are we trying to sell here? Well, the NFT. Okay. Anything else? You know, what do people think they're purchasing? You know, that's why it, it, it seems as the space matures, unfortunately, there's just going to have to be a lot more lawyering done, which is never the answer people want. But, you know, for high value NFT runs, et cetera, and as, you know, kind of long running ones, there are going to just have to be lots more agreements in place that are very explicit, you know. And we haven't even talked about, you know, what happens with if the underlying platform, you know, one of the platforms goes out of business, Okay. Well, presumably the information is stored on a blockchain somewhere. You know, it could be Ethereum. It could be there are other platforms that are offering this. Can one of those platforms use that information that's stored on the underlying blockchain and then display it and resell it? Could they, you know, just create a viewer for somebody that's persistent beyond, you know, the sales platform? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, you would think that as you deal with maybe higher value NFT sales, that ultimately we move to the purchaser also taking responsibility for maintaining the storage where that is. Because at the base of it, you would think, I mean, again, there might be some infrastructure component to it, but if it's stored on like AWS, you have, number one, AWS, well, I think most of us would think that AWS doesn't disappear but you know yeah. we're talking we're talking about <laughs> something but you know if you're thinking about like a nft like a painting which you want to pass down to your children who's to say amazon's going to be around and you know you might find out mm -hmm. you know a hundred years from now oh, now obviously that's not you but your kids you know or their their kids you know they're like oh yeah grandpa bought this nft way back when and he passed it through the lineage and 
oh, AWS got acquired by what? They got acquired by Uniswap in the year 2034. <laughs> uh, and then Uniswap got acquired by a, you know, a Russian prince. Uh, you know, like the world changes and all of a sudden, right. like, Nobody can figure out where things lie. And if you're not the one who, like, if you have the property right and you're maintaining it, then it's shame on you. You should just be like, oh, crap, you know, AWS is being acquired by Uniswap. I got to, like, by the way, there's no breaking news here. This is just a, a ridiculous <laughs> hypothetical example, who, which may, you know, may ultimately not be ridiculous. But at any rate, you know, you have the responsibility for taking that action. But if you're relying on somebody else, like they're selling the NFT to your point, like, you know, if, if I'm selling a whole bunch of NFTs, you know, am I going to be focused on everyone? I'm going to be focused on the set, but let's say my mm -hmm. business doesn't go well to your point, you know, or there's a transition, you know, we certainly know that during transitions, things get dropped. So a hundred years from now, the NFT that's supposed to last for a hundred years what happens to it? Like if I'm spending like whoever bought people for, you know, 6.9 million or whatever, you know, or some other similar thing like that, where it wasn't really a trade, a, a trade, it was more of a, I'm going to buy this as a store of value. If you're buying it or as, if you, as a collectible, something you want to appreciate, something that you want to enjoy, something that you want to pass through your family, it becomes very important who's, mm -hmm. who's storing it. Yeah. And I, I think you're exactly right. If it's, if this is something that you want to take every precaution to make sure it persists then right now you yeah you have to come up with some bespoke self-custody plan i would think it would be interesting to know if any of the custody services out there are trying to develop nft custody services that would address this need for people you know because it's one thing to custody crypto you know large amounts of crypto but it's quite something different i believe to try and custody this because of all the associated information, right? I mean, I suppose the simplest NFT sale is just, there's a, a link to a digital image somewhere. And so you just gotta make sure that you, the link is gonna persist, which if it's on, you know, the Ethereum blockchain as a part of the transaction, you should be fine, <laughs> one would think. Yeah. And then it's just, okay, we gotta make sure that we can actually save this digital image. But, you know, if you've used technology for a long enough period of time, you know, file extensions and different types of files change over time. And so then, you know, how are you maintaining compatibility moving, moving forward? You know, and maybe that's not as much of an issue at the moment, but to your point, in 50 years, I mean, is everyone gonna be still using JPEGs? I mean, maybe, maybe JPEG is the, you know, the picture format for the, the Galactic Empire moving forward. I don't know. But would you want to bank on that? You know, probably not. Yeah. And, and I mean, to use another example, which which is totally, I just thought of, so it, it, it may be like just too silly, but a number of years ago, about 20 years ago, my father and I, we got genealogy software. And he, he got busy like scanning everything in. Well, that genealogy software has changed multiple times such that Honestly, I don't even know what happened to all the stuff we had. I did ultimately get its PDF scanned and whatever and retained, but that whole framework of how things were interconnected and everything else, we kind of had an assumption like, hey, we do all this work. We're not going to be like genealogists for the next 20 years, right? <laughs> right? And then, you know, fast forward, it's like, oh, the software has been upgraded like a bazillion times. And unless I was like hyper-focused on it, like now I'm, I'm like, you know, I've got end of life that's no longer supported and mm -hmm. there's no way I can get back to that original structure. And it's like, okay, that didn't quite work unless I sort of saved it on my, what, my 186 in a corner somewhere, my d defunct computer, I still boot that thing up, which I'm mm -hmm. not. So, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's the same kind of thing, like, you know, f frameworks and technology changes and the players change as well. So it, it, mm -hmm. I, it raises those questions, you know, and can be as concerning as when you get like a 404 error when you try to access your link, right? It's like the right. link is broken and it's like, uh oh, what happened here? And that might be the first you know about that you've got a problem. Right, right. Yeah, I actually saw something recently that was talking about, you know, more or less everyone has transitioned to streaming services if they listen to music online. And there's basically just a huge swath of MP3 files from artists, you know, from all over that just didn't make the transition. And so now it's kind of, it's a, like a, just a lost collection out there, like you were saying. And if you weren't hyper vigilant to make sure that, you know, it was maintained across your systems over the years, well, too bad. You know, I mean, that, that's the interesting thing is, you know, a lot of the crypto space 
as, the, as it gets more digitized and we're relying on well ourselves to maintain that across electronic systems to change over time, I don't know that we've necessarily had to do that all that much in human history, short of perhaps, you know, language translation for, a, but ever since we invented writing, like that's a pretty persistent form of data storage. Electronic data storage, the formats change so frequently that there's probably a graveyard of NFTs that are sitting right there that just haven't, you know, gone in the graveyard yet. Right. I, I guess it, it sort of bleeds into another point, which somehow resolves the ability of property to transfer with the NFT, but may not have the longevity, which is like these hash related functions that are actually built into the NFT protocol, like mm -hmm. crypto kitties, where there's some component that is unique to the NFT that can't be replicated. So basically you have those those hash related functions that allows you to compile it in a unique way. But again, it requires it being supported. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is you got something that, that only right. transfers with the NFT, but you know, like the 186, you know, where's the 186 now? How many people are are booting up 186s? Uh, I think it's not, you. I think it's not, just you. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't have a 186 anywhere in my vicinity. Uh, the old Commodore, you know, um, unless you're like really retro, right? What are the trends that you're currently seeing in the NFTs, where the, the, you know the property rights or even the royalty rights are being further delineated in a way that's either within a platform or cross-platform? Yeah, well, I don't know that we've necessarily seen yet a lot of platform activity. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the majority of the royalty rights that have been associated with NFT sales are somewhat dependent on the platform just honoring it. <laughs> I remember there was kind of a, a kerfuffle not that long ago where some artists specifically wanted royalty for secondary NFT sales of her work, but it was on a different platform. And she reached out to, you know, the initial sale platform saying, hey, you know, this was part of the agreement. And I realize this is not occurring on your platform, but, you know, are you going to make good on on this? And there's a question of, well, does the platform even have to make good on that? Right. You know, is that, is that necessarily part of the agreement that they had with that artist? I don't know. You'd have to look at the, you know, the actual agreements. But that would be a very interesting result if you end up with an ecosystem of platforms that are collaborating in a way to make sure that they're all kind of honoring each other's royalty programs. However, you know, they may realize that, hey, this is a really cool d idea, but for us, we just don't even want to touch any of it. So we're just going to specifically disclaim that away. We're not even going to bother. It's too complicated. I don't want to pay my lawyers to even make sure that, you know, we can do it, let alone make sure I'm protected, you know, because with all of this stuff, you know, there's the technical side of it and there's the legal side of it. And to a certain extent, I think the answer is often the technical side of it is a bit easier <laughs> to actually implement for people to do. And it's the legal side of it where, you know, these kind of technical realities crash in the meat space that you have problems, right? I know there are, have been multiple efforts to try and, you know, build licenses into the NFT sales themselves sometimes trying to get as much of that on chain as possible. And I think that'll be an area of a lot of growth because I do think that there's a lot of demand in the space for that from NFT purchasers and from artists alike, you know, who are trying to make those sales more enticing, I would think, by saying, no, you are, you're not just getting the NFT, you're getting the copyright associated with it, or you're getting a, a license that goes beyond, you know, kind of what you would expect for a normal NFT transaction. Um, as far as at a baseline, what you're purchasing, you know, you're, you're buying the NFT and that's some sort of token that pe some people say it's a receipt, some people say it's a certificate of authenticity. <laughs> Not to be too early, we have, I don't know of any case yet, any litigation that's tried to address what it is legally speaking, other than, hey, this is some sort of crypto token <laughs> that has particular characteristics depending on its creation and, you know, what blockchain it's associated with, you know, and so I think... You and I may have to wait till uh, uh, some professor or somebody who writes way too many academic articles, Drew Hinkes, to actually write out a paper <laughs> explaining the, you know, 12 different varietals of NFT legal standing. You know, I, I don't, I just don't think there's really a straightforward answer. It's, we're still very much in the, you know, the facts and circumstances phase of this until we get kind of 
standardized templates on the technical side that are matched up with standardized templates on the legal side. You know, so there's there's kind of more of a alignment of exactly what's going on. You know, and part of that is I, I think in this why, you know, this this podcast is valuable, especially for the crypto space in general, is a large part of this is just educating the legal profession of the technical realities. Like, okay, you know, this is what on the technical side, this is what one of these transactions means. You know, this is what's actually occurring. Are there, you know, and, and it's it's really an issue spotting exercise for lawyers, which, you know, that's kind of one of our primary training programs, right? But if they don't fully appreciate what's kind of technically going on with respect to, you know, sales that they're advising clients on, platforms that they're trying to, you know, help navigate these issues, if they don't really get down to the kind of the, the brass tacks of the technical reality, then the legal advice may not fully align with what they think they're giving, if that right. makes sense. It does. And and I think on the royalties, I'm, I'm pretty sure that OpenSeas and Rarible do have an integration that allows them to recognize uh, royalties cross-platform. And I know I read something a while ago about there being some work about trying to actually limit the transferability to platforms that don't within the NFT, like uh, some sort of where a blocker. And I, I don't know really? how that would work, but it would, you know, that gets into more complicated qu- questions because now you're restricting somebody's ability, like did they buy it, recognizing that there would be limitations on it that were imposed and it's not free and clear. But that's something that's I know is being discussed. And you know, on the on the platform integration, like we we talked a little bit beforehand about OpenSeas doing a raise with A sixteen Z or Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, and before that, I think Rarible had also speaking of Rarible, another uh, large raise. There's definitely venture money flowing into this space. Mark Cuban is active in a number of projects. The Winkle Boss, the Winkle the Winkle Bosses. What's their platform? Is it Nifties or? I think it's Nifty Gateway. Nifty Gateway. So there's, you know, and and so all these different platforms are going to take different technical approaches. But, you know, I wonder for platforms, like I think Rarible might be a very good one just because they seem to be focused more on the the unique NFTs, the truly unique, as opposed to the Mm series-based NFTs. Mm -hmm. That might be one where, when you buy the NFT, I just wonder, it's like, I wonder if it's almost like, you know, before you buy it, you get to click on a list. Like, what am I buying? Like I'm buying, you know, right. like maybe there's only like, I can take the whole thing off for like, you know, this amount of money, but maybe I don't want to, like, maybe I want a license and maybe the next person who comes in who wants to take it out is taking it out, but has to, is taking it subject to the license that's already been created under another one, which might be a risky proposition, but it gives them some sort of enforceability. You know, it'd have to be some mm-hmm. creative lawyering because now you're, te- you're dealing with an instantaneous transaction and, you know, you're trying to build in all the different rights. But I mean, do you think that's something that a platform like, it doesn't really have to be rareable, but do you think that's something that a platform that focuses more on that more one-to-one type NFT or one to a few might attack or or like or do you think we're going to be just sort of in the the wild west for a while and and when lawyers get involved they get involved and what are your yeah. thoughts yeah i mean i think i wouldn't say it's a complete wild west i mean it's it's but it is wild west to a certain degree because there are legal considerations associated with, from the traditional art world that kind of have bled into this and you know the people building the platforms are not necessarily coming from that traditional art world. And I think that that may be why we've seen kind of traditional collectors, big name collectors avoid NFTs up to this point, not completely, but you know, they're used to dealing with a, you know, a marketplace that has centuries of kind of norms and legal regimes built up around it. And it's not like this is all being written from whole cloth and it's, you know, there's nothing that we can expect to actually bring in. It's just where are those pieces going to fit in? And so I think that's an interesting kind of point that somebody like Rarible or another platform could take. Hey, we're going to be, I don't want button up isn't the right word, but we're going to focus on, you know, these are legitimately, there's only one of this. Oh, by the way, we've also built a technical infrastructure and legal infrastructure around it to give a higher degree of certainty to that exclusivity. I'm sure there's plenty of people that will pay a premium for that. I mean, that's just an interesting idea of, you know, 
we could sit here and riff and try and figure out, okay, well, what are some of the characteristics of that, what that would look like? And I think you listed some of them, but as you know, you know, you really kind of have to start drafting up an agreement. Okay, well, this is what we, are we actually covering this? And, you know, the developers would have to make sure, okay, is this even possible, you know, for the underlying blockchain that we're running, will this contract even work? <laughs> you know, and those are, are questions that you, that would ultimately have to be addressed. You know, I think that it would be an interesting outcome and not a necessarily bad or good if we see some sort of bifurcation of the market where, you have basically kind of, for lack of a better example, uh, the Ebays of NFTs where it's just kind of, you could sell NFTs of all different type, series, unique, whatever, and it's a much more volume-based play versus, hey, we have very particular exclusive selling points. And, um, you know, that's where we make our money and that's where we attract interest. You know, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of shakes out. And I do think, all of this, you know, the injection of all this cash from venture says probably two things. One, this is a frothy market. I, I'm not saying anything I don't think anybody would disagree with. But at the same time, I do think it indicates, well, there's something, there's a there there, right? There's something here. I do think that, you know, it's funny because, you know, you mentioned CryptoKitties earlier and there's also CryptoPunks and, you know, those are really kind of the original NFTs and they've been around for years, right? But no one outside of crypto care, <laughs> you know, like it was a big deal when it happened. It was cool and it was interesting, but like normies didn't care about that. Honestly, I think the success of, you know, the NBA Top Shot program, uh, you know, starting more or less in December of 2020 and kind of bleeding into the beginning of this year is what really kind of started drawing in mainstream interest. And, you know, as long as there's going to continue to be decent UI in terms of purchasing and creating these things and it gets better and, you know, these questions continue to be worked out, you know, who knows how big the market is? I mean, human beings have been collecting things <laughs> forever and, you know, the art world is not small, you know, and if you think of this as kind of bragging rights, right, you're purchasing some form of bragging rights. Well, people will pay a lot for that. Yeah. You know, the one thing it's it's so funny you mentioned Top Shots is because I think Top Shots raises a question which I haven't yet kind of figured out. It's like you you have Top Shots, which sort of did this deal with the NBA, which the NBA didn't completely embrace if you read a lot of the publicity, because I think uh, Top Shots, they were pushing the envelope in terms of like, you know, I heard the marketing guy of Top Shots say, this is a chance to get in on the ground floor. I'm like, ooh. That's that's not good from a securities analysis perspective. That's like the one thing you don't want to say. But you know, I was just like, think you know, and this may be why the NBA is backing off. But so you have the NBA; they do this deal with Top Shots. I don't know, like they they create these moments, but I don't right. know, like if Top Shots really owns the moments. They're just moments. They're like baseball cards. Like you have Tops, you have a bunch of other people doing baseball cards. You know, which one's worth more? Tops has been around for a longer period of time. The newbies may be worth less because nobody knows about them, but then they do something cool and maybe they're worth a little bit more. But so you have like the NBA Top Shots. Then you have like, I mean, I have a client, but you have different, like you have a music festival for artists and you have a labor, a record label for artists and you have artists and then you have players within the NBA. You have teams within the NBA. Mm -hmm. You have the NBA. Maybe you have broadcasting. And they all could be doing like NFTs. And maybe they're all doing the exact same moments. Like the player in the NFT, he's not going to be like, yeah, I didn't sign away my moment. That's still my moment. I can do with it what I want. And he's like, no, 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 that's our moment. Because, you know, you worked for us. And the NBA is like, no, 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 that's our moment. And then like Top Shots can be like, no, that's we published it first. But, you know, so I don't think anybody really cares, right? Because I think all mm -hmm. these things will be released. And if I'm the player who's in the moment and I release the NFT, I don't know, is that worth more than Top Shots? I guess it depends on a lot of different factors and the player's got to like position himself to say, no, 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 I'm the real OG. And then Top Shots are going to be like, no, 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 we're the real OG, you know? And, and <laughs> you know, which one's the real OG? You know, you're just a fake. I got the real deal. You know, it's like you have like 30 of the same moment that everybody's like, no, 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 no. I was the guy sitting at the stand and the sweat dripped on me. And that makes me the OG because I have sweat. I even like got it notarized. See? Um, 
So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just going to be a competition for, you know, who's the real OG or like, but you even get that today with like even right. live music, like, you know, you, you have a track right. and it's played like 30 different times in different concerts. Well, which one's the real one? Now it all goes back to Pearl Jam or whoever did the live thing or and Pearl, I mean, there's like a bazillion big bands, but I just think of Pearl Jam because they do a lot of live stuff. And, you know, I mean, which one's the oh, real yeah. OG, you know, but yeah, the original that, one is, but. I think that brings us back full circle in a sense of, everything related to art is very subjective, you know, more so than, you know, and, and I think that's an important distinction more so than kind of the money side of crypto, right? You know, that, that has a certain, I don't know, more, in my opinion, more objectivity attached to it than this. It's kind of like, because they're, you're, you're right. We're going to have a situation too. And I wouldn't be surprised if this happens within the next, I don't know, year or so where you're going to have some, you know, Heisman candidate, NCAA player, who's going to sell, you know, a series of NFT moments of themselves on some platform. And, you know, one of the power schools that they play for is going to be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, because recently, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that NCAA players can start profiting off themselves and their work as student athletes to a certain degree. But there's, you know, what is that going to look like? You know, it, it'll probably start as just, and this is a tangent too, but it'll probably start as, you know, ads on their Instagram page, right? For some sport drink or whatever. But it'll start getting a little weird once they kind of, if they ever incorporate video, audio that is, you know, associated with the school they're at. You know, if I was those school's lawyers, I would be trying to kind of forecast, okay, where are we? comfortable with them having rights, you know, and giving them a license to do these sorts of things because they haven't had to consider all of this, right? And another interesting thing, like you said about NBA Top Shot, it was my understanding, I thought that with respect to the IP associated with the moments, the NBA takes the position that they own all of that. They gave up nothing and they had no intention to. But the odd thing about the NBA is that it's more akin to kind of a federal system than it is kind of a, a dictatorship in that each individual team has a, a certain amount of rights and ability to do things. And so we've actually seen this now where the Miami Heat just put out some sort of NFT launch. I don't know if it's actually launched yet, but they're selling, I believe, historical moments in the Heat's history. Well, it would seem like that would be at odds with you know the NBA's position. And to your point, okay, well, what if I own a Miami Heat NBA top shot moment and then yeah, I, you know, you own the Miami Heat version of it. Which one is the OE or the OG? These are questions that haven't had, nobody's had to really answer yet, you know? And again, not to, to be too lawyerly, but until somebody sues someone else, you know, we're not going to get some sort of uh, at least bright line. Well, we know in this jurisdiction, this is the position the courts have taken, right? Until then, it's just kind of, it's intellectually fascinating to try and work through, okay, well, what, what the hell do people actually own? <laughs> what are their responsibilities? You know, and and where is this going to go? Where are the risks? So I'm I'm going to use that as a segue to to another point, which is you know what we talked about initially at the beginning, which is moving from the image that has value in and of itself to something that is simply a, a certificate of authenticity, something that is more representative of some other right that doesn't lie within the image itself. So, for example. Uh, a notarized document, like maybe in the context of a song. And again, this is not, you know, in the context of a song, there's a contract and it's a notarized contract. And when I get the, when I purchase it, when I make that election, I get that notarized contract. Maybe I get the, the registration at the PTO, whatever. Why would an NFT be better than a notarized deed? Well, presumably the NFT would be a lot more liquid, right? The notarized deed is a physical object you have to deliver to somebody which means you have to convince somebody they actually have the physical object <laughs> to a certain level that they are willing to then purchase it for, from you and whatever it's associated with, you know, and that those are high transaction costs with this. I mean, fundamentally, crypto is kind of a, a transaction cost lowering technology. I know people, some critics may take issue with that, but that's the promise behind all of it, right? And so, you know, one thing that, people have tried to do over the years is tried to create liquid intellectual property asset markets, right? Make it easier for people to trade, 
patents, trademarks, copyrights, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, official documents that have to, you know, be signed and make sure that, you know, the transfer is actually being uh, done correctly. There's also the issue of just matching people together with these things. And so, you know, there are a couple of attempts to try and make that process easier uh, via NFTs because, you know, the information is out there on a blockchain and anybody can view it and verify it basically instantly. And so that's a lot easier for them to trade it, perhaps. With respect to that example I just gave, IP assets and how they're valued is a complete black box and really only kind of makes sense in the context of litigation, you know, which is why the previous attempts, I think, have failed to cry and create a market for these IP assets, right? But with respect to deeds, I mean, I believe there's actually a couple of different NFT related, like fractionalized real estate plays that people are exploring at the moment. That of course raises all a host of other, you know, legal issues beyond this. And you may have talked about that with, with some of the other people on the show, but, you know, I think the promise of, of increased liquidity and, and lower transaction costs are kind of the main drivers behind that. It just seems to be a bit easier to create a marketplace for this, given that a lot of the verification of the underlying information is just faster. Right. But, and I guess it's also depends on the asset class. And, right. you know, I, I, I know, like, for example, in the residential market, some people say, look, oh, you know, NFTs would be so superior, right? But then you think about it. If my house turns over every 20 years, right? And I do the transaction once as a seller, maybe I don't really even care, right? Like I have to, or a buyer, I know I have to still file it with the county clerk's office. And having worked in the government, you kind of know who you're going to be looking at on the other side, you know, when you're trying to explain it to them and the person's just like, you know, saying, uh, hold it, I'm having a problem with getting into <laughs> DOS right now, you know? And you're like, well, cause we got this like NFT stuff. And you'd be like, I, Sonny, I just, can you give me the document? I'm going to triplicate. I'm going to do it on the carbon paper that we right, have, right. you know, to, to make sure and, and file it, you know, in, in the, in the, in the back office where it's a fire hazard, but that's the way we've been doing it since the beginning of time. And I really don't <laughs> feel like changing it because nobody's paying me enough to think about <laughs> NFTs. Right. Right. And so in that market, you know, it's hard to see it making sense from like a buyer or a seller or even necessarily a real estate agent, you know, mm -hmm. hey, you can buy this through an NFT. People like some people be like, cool, but what does that mean? Like, uh, you know, it's just a small up fee because I got to make money because I'm doing it. Well, I don't really know that makes sense to me. So it's like you start to break down where does it make sense? It might make sense where, you know, there's more of a broader international market or let's say I'm buying real estate on the other side of the world. I mean, I'm not going to be going to the county clerk's office. And I guess it's just a servicing entity that would kind of mm -hmm. use, I mean, how does an NFT differ from like, could you send me, could you do a PDF of the notarized deed and send it back to me and send it to me via FedEx because I want to touch something? Like, does an NFT really help there? It, it really only helps when you think something's going to take more than one hop. Right. right. And you've got something, you know, but if you're thinking like, you know, like we were talking earlier about the sort of that legacy purchase, the legacy purchase makes sense if, if the very thing I'm buying is a digital artifact, right. Mm -hmm. And it's something I want to retain, but if it's in a digital representation of something else, you know, it's right. Well, in certain asset classes, you need, the transactions need to be reversible. <laughs> and we don't have that here in this, you know, in most uh, every single instance, basically. And so, you know, there was a project here in Cook County, which Chicago is in. Um, and Cook County, I think, is one of the, if it's not the largest, it's one of the largest uh, land deed recording offices in the country. And they were exploring the use of, I think it was actually the colored coin scheme, you know, that used Bitcoin as kind of the underlying platform. And they put out a big report. I want to say 2016 about, you know, the approach that they did to try and transition the land records here in Cook County to some sort of blockchain based system. And that was the biggest thing. There was like, look, we need to be able to reverse transactions and it's just going to be too much of a pain to if we used a system like this, you know, because as they say, like grandma can't lose her house because she lost her private key, you know, like. So there are certain asset classes where if you don't have some sort of reversibility, you know, legally speaking, I don't know how it could ever really work. You know, that's not to say that 
you know, willing buyers and willing sellers that are willing to take on certain risks can't engage in transactions for certain assets. It's just kind of, as you said, you know, when you have to deal with the government and meat space, well, you may not get the answer you want if it doesn't, you know, follow the the Byzantine rule system that they've had in place, which, by the way, has allowed them to maintain a ledger for hundreds of years, you know, and in a sense, those deeds are kind of NFTs themselves. They just don't live, you know, and travel at the speed of light, like, you know, the things on OpenSea and Rare World, et cetera. Right. I mean, I, I guess you have the risk of fire or, or something, some physical event, but it's interesting because trying to do it on a public blockchain probably doesn't make a lot of sense if you do want to incorporate that notion of re- reversibility. But I mean, fundamentally, from a distributed ledger or like a, even a private blockchain, you can impose your own rules. Of course, it's not immutable, so then maybe it doesn't fit the the true definition of you know what would people think in terms of immutability on a blockchain. But what you're really looking for is if you want reversibility, then don't think in terms of immutable. Think in terms of something like distributed ledger, and mm-hmm. you could have the digital representation. I mean, on some level, the technology described differently you can accomplish a lot of the same goals using terms that aren't as crypto native, right? Right. Hey, scan in the deed or type in an electronic record of the deed and put it on a distributed ledger that is, you know, that you have validated by, you know, your supervisor and everything else. And that's what makes it authentic. And if there's a court order, that's a rule where the validator would then do it pursuant to the court order and note it in the ledger accordingly that I've reversed this pursuant to court order. And it's in this, this distributed ledger that is viewed as the Oracle, uh, you know, for forever until it turns out that they didn't get enough budget to transfer over to the new technology (laughs) and they can't figure out what they did. So then they get all these backups and maybe they're still printing out tons of paper anyway. And they're like, yeah, I'm so glad we went digital. It's like the things are coming off the Xerox machine and they're putting in the files. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I I like that. That different way of, framing the technology, you know, permission distributed ledgers could provide a lot of efficiency gains in certain areas and respect, you know, and actually that was part of what drew me to the crypto space in general was my background in voting because voting is a double spend problem, right? You only want people to be registered in one place and you only want them to be able to vote once, right? So, you know, I do think there's potential, but you know, budgetary concerns and everything else come into play at, as well as technical talent. And, you know, are they really going to hire IBM to do this for them and spend the whatever tens of million dollars to spin up the system? I mean, maybe some states, <laughs> but, you know, anyways, that's a bit of a tangent to the NFTs, but. But it's know. actually not. It's actually not because it goes really, it goes directly to like what is at the core of an NFT. Like if you're a company selling to a municipality, you're probably an idiot if you go into the most jurisdictions and say, hey, why don't we take all your records and make them into NFTs, you know? And then somebody would be like, wasn't that that crazy thing they did on Saturday Night Live? You know, or you could say, listen, you've got all this stuff in paper, digitize it because it's crumbling, it's old, you can't find it, it's inefficient. Okay, we can do that. Okay, now that you've done that, why don't we put it on a ledger system so that you can better track how it changes ownership? Oh yeah, we can do that. And now what's the, you know, and if you really ultimately say, hey, this has to connect to a larger system where there is a market for it. Oh, let's think about how, let's do an API so we can have an interface with Mm -hmm. it. I mean, that is interesting. And I never really thought of, you know, say you had some sort of system that guarantees the land records amongst all the clerk's offices in Cook County, right? Or whatever official, and they all maintain their own copy of the ledger. But you, for certain types of properties, allow other people to basically jack in, right? And they can effectuate sales on different platforms and the government just has to sign off on it. I mean, that's an interesting idea. Like a validator. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Yeah, but then you have to to be comfortable, you know, trying to sell to the government, working with the government. You know, and this space is, uh, well, let's just say historically, that it's not an area they're interested in. (laughs) There's a marketplace where us more crypto native. I don't know if I even call myself crypto native yet. It's a continuum. But there's those who are more tech savvy. And we like to think, you know, it is revolutionary technology. It is going to change the world over time, (laughs) you know. But 
the rest of the world, you know, a lot of them are operating under the old systems and they're still catching up with technology from like 10 years ago. And, you know, you'd be shocked. And I'm, now I'm going on a tangent, but you'd be shocked at like municipalities, how like backwards they are on like cybersecurity. I tried selling cybersecurity mm-hmm. to municipalities and they're running like end of life servers. I'm just like, there's nothing I can do here. Like <laughs> you're running end of life servers. Like I don't even know where to begin to secure you. So that's what you're sort of dealing with. You know, well, we, we have a crimp budget. We'll look for it next year and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, you know, municipalities, counties, you know, title deeds, car, UCC filings, all that stuff. Again, I think where there's a, where there's liquidity, the money will you know, see that see that as an opportunity because there's with each transaction there's the ability to capture something and you know maybe that's in music rights. Music rights might sort of lead the charge on that because certainly the music industry has been abused by copyright uh, to date. You know, with Spotify and everything else, so they're they have to kind of figure things out and NFTs could enable them to do so. Yeah, it's kind of a to to your point. I think what you just highlighted kind of gets to my sense of the future in that I've always, I mean, I like Star Trek and I've watched the movies and I've really watched TV shows, right? But it was always like just too idealized sense of the future. And I always thought Star Wars where you have like crazy, you know, planet destroying technology, but there's also still just like literal junkyards and like (laughs) people using sticks. I'm like, yep, that's the future we're headed, right? You know? We'll have, you know, certain markets and certain things that are completely mind blowing to us, but there's still, we're always going to have clerks with carbon copy paper who are going to be recording something somewhere. Right. So this was a great discussion, Nelson. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, If people want to find out more about you, your law firm, where can they find you? Yeah. So I am unfortunately very active on Twitter. You can follow me there or reach out to me there at Nelson M. Rosario. Or, you know, feel free to drop me an email, nelson at smorozlaw, that's uh, S-M-O-R-O-S-L-A-W dot com. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. It was great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks, Eric. This was a blast. Appreciate it.